Uh, good short video on the current conflict, including maps, etc. That's really interesting because I've been talking to our boy uh, Cappy. As a matter of fact, I, I've been I've been DMing him and and talking to him about like, at the very least, uh, the the military aspect of this because from a military Pravis perspective, when you uh, just completely remove the situation from from the human toll, which is of course going to be one of the major things that we're going to be talking about today, um, this is an unimaginable, an unimaginable uh, moment. Uh, this has never happened before. Like, this is not something that usually happens, and, and I'm going to try to make sense of how it happened. Obviously, I'm going to be talking about why it happened. Um, people say it's unprecedented, and that part is actually true. It's, it's, a, it's, a, very, it's a very unique uh, historical moment. Uh, for many different reasons, I think complacency plays a big role in it. It is a it, it is a a massive, massive failure on behalf of the settler colonial apartheid state of Israel. The fact that they have a gigantic military apparatus, a gigantic surveillance apparatus, and they completely missed it. And what I'm hearing, at least from internal sources, is that the reason why they may have missed this, or at least kept the southern border so the, the southern border was so penetrable and part of that reason i am hearing and i don't know if this is correct or not but internal uh messages show that the fuck up actually came from moving some of idf's resources away from the southern wall and the southern area and into the west bank to protect the uh, ultra nationalist sickos in the west bank that have been partitioning off areas and engaging in an unjustifiable act of settler terrorism. So that was keeping a lot of I, uh, the IDF's resources. So uh, it seems like the, the, the uh, border control was not as, uh, not as, uh, as, as severe as it normally should be. Maybe they were over reliant on their technology. These are really interesting components of the situation beyond the human toll. I have spoken on this already. I've spoken uh, about this on Twitter, obviously. I know that there were some people who were uh, looking to hear what I had to say about the issue, considering my uh, support for Palestine. And of course, I am still in support of Palestine. I believe that the people of Palestine deserve emancipation, just like the people of Ukraine deserve emancipation. Uh, this is one of the most unjustifiable and unimaginable and ongoing acts of cruelty. And that cruelty, of course, is going to inevitably have some kind of blowback. This is what Israel and the Israeli citizens are currently experiencing. The unimaginable cruelty, a fraction of it being uh, being experienced. And, and of course... The, the victims, the toll is taken upon the normal citizens. I am not going to be one of those people that says like, oh, they're settlers. They, do, they, they deserve the violence. They deserve, you know, getting shot in the streets. No, nobody deserves that. That is precisely the reason why I always criticize Israel. Obviously, nobody deserves that. But this is, of course, and this is, of course, going to happen. What do you think is going to happen when you have an open air prison that you have been operating for years and years, when you bomb it, when you when you operate an open air prison that you routinely bomb, that you control the water supply, that you refuse to let concrete into, that you control the fucking uh, water line in general, that you stop, that you prevent people from fishing in, that you uh, that you have refuse to allow to have desalination plants inside of when 97 percent of the water supply is toxic when the average age is 18 some of those kids some of those men and some of those kids for the first time experience something beyond the inner walls of palestine the inner walls of gaza for the first time ever that is insane okay these <sighs> I think there's a lot of people out there who are very passionate about what's going on. And, and I think that some people do not have uh, a good assessment on the situation. And they are, of course, immediately showing that their, their uh, allegiances or their interest in emancipation for all peoples, freedom for all peoples, is entirely conditional. 
Okay. And, um, you know, there are obviously still some incredibly brave people out there. But like I said, this is uh, asymmetrical violence. We are going to learn more about it because I think that people need to understand uh, what that looks like. Here is a good example of an Israeli left-wing Knesset member. We condemn and oppose any assault on innocent civilians, but in contrast to the Israeli government, that means we must oppose any assault on Palestinian civilians as well. We must analyze those terrible incidents, the attacks in the right context, and that is the ongoing occupation, Kasif said. We have been warning time and time again, everything is going to erupt and everyone is going to pay a price, mainly innocent civilians on both sides. And unfortunately, that is exactly what happened, he said. The Israeli government, which is a fascist government, this is true, supports, encourages, and leads pogroms against the Palestinians, also true. There is an ethnic cleansing going on. It was obvious the writing was on the wall, written in the blood of the Palestinians, and unfortunately now Israelis as well. If you recall, when Israel was having its own constitutional crisis, one thing that I brought up, as, as well as many other leftists who are very familiar with Israel, have either lived in Israel or, uh, or, or have... Uh, you know, a lot of, of experience with Israeli politics said the exact same thing. They said these kinds of internal struggles are never going to end because these internal struggles are not born out of mere disagreements between different parties. These internal struggles are happening because this is happening inside an apartheid state. That's it. This is one of the best answers to 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 the the supposedly complex problem of what is going on in Israel this is Michael Brooks I am going to mention it I'm going to show you uh, what Michael Brooks said and we are going to continue uh, uh, on with our coverage but obviously uh, first and foremost like I said where is it where is it where is it oh here I will I will obviously uh, cover the Michael Brooks thing really quickly. Uh, do we know if the hostages were released? No. I am going to first give the uh, I'm going to first give the the short uh, Michael Brooks clip on it. Rest in power to Michael Brooks, Michael Jamal Brooks uh, on the Israeli apartheid. I think this is probably a really uh, really good framework for a lot of people who have no way of comprehending the situation to understand a a role reversal, if you will. It's not a complex issue. That's the big thing. It's super simple. There's one group that has enormous power. It's the most powerful country in the Middle East. It's backed by the United States. It acts on another population of people with total impunity and is never held accountable for anything. So there's no symmetry in the relationship, period. And just as like a thought experiment, IDW people, if we know that if somehow a population of Jewish refugees ended up in West Bank and Gaza, and an Arabic government in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv had an open air prison in, in what, you know, Jewish Gaza, which they bombed with white phosphorus, they killed civilians indiscriminately, and they had no uh, provisions for medicine, they had an embargo that blocked food, that the electricity wasn't running, that there was an over 48% unemployment rate, life expectancy and malnutrition statistics were horrifying. The, uh, one of the major uh, policy makers in this hypothetical Arabic Palestinian state said, we need to put those Jews on a diet. In the West Bank, there was another Jewish area where there was a little bit more autonomy, but there was regular Arabic settlements where they pulled up the Jewish farmers' foods, they terrorized them with rocks, the security forces broke children's bones, and they couldn't drive their own roads. We'd all have no problem understanding what that was. So there's nothing complex about it. The second part of your question, it's, it's a pure asymmetry relationship. It's not complex. He's absolutely correct. Michael Brooks passed away in 2020 due to a pulmonary embolism, unfortunately. It's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not that complex if you are aware of the situation or, I mean, since the inception of the Israeli state, but certainly if you are aware, if, even at the very least since like, the past 20 years, I would say. Benjamin Netanyahu is perhaps one of the worst things that could have happened to a colonial state that uh, only increased in its brutality over the course of Benjamin Netanyahu's tenure. This is something that even Israelis inside of Israel, despite how much uh, anger they feel towards Palestinians, also recognize. Benjamin Netanyahu has built a robust far-right network that he take he took advantage of and seized power once again 
if you want to understand it from the perspective of like internal politics, that is your guy. He is bloodthirsty and violent and has made Israel somehow an even more uh, bloodthirsty nation state. And now he has right-wing figures to his right, like Ben Gavir, who are causing actual collapses internally inside of Israel. However, yes, Kahanas perverts. If you, if you, you're an Israeli person, if you're an Israeli citizen, if you are living in Israel and you do not recognize that those internal rifts are happening only because Israel is also an apartheid state, the, the spiritual damage that it causes to everyday existence, I don't know what to tell you. Said it time and time again. It's just like how white supremacy kills white people as well. Okay? This is very important. Um, I will talk about the longer clip. We'll go into the longer clip of Michael Brooks. But we are going to be watching uh, the, uh, the, the Abby Martin uh, Gaza documentary as well. I think it's like very informative about why what's happening is happening. And uh, yeah, it will never, this violence will never end. I know this because I'm an American and I live in America and I know I see it. Israel, obviously, due to its proximity to the violence itself, due to its uh, closeness to the, the apartheid that it's currently facilitating, uh, cannot see it. America rests on top of indigenous genocide and slavery, and yet these, there are racial wounds that have yet to be healed. That is the reason why we are constantly fucking ourselves, okay? Israel, in its inception, and in, at this stage, is also going through that... Uh, tumultuous period. So, can you explain why people like Trudeau are supporting Israel? I'm scared. What do you mean? The Western world has always been in support of Israel and will always be in support of Israel. If you want to understand the divide inside of the... The divide on the planet, um, yes, the global south, for the most part, will always... Global south or colonized people will oftentimes support Palestine and Palestinian liberation and developed nation states that have engaged in colonial violence throughout their history and still continue to engage in neo-colonial violence to this day that benefit from the unequal exchange within the global south will always support Israel both financially with military support and and yeah that's it except for India India is the one place which I'm sure you guys have seen India and Indian Twitter turned into, uh, it created some of the most interesting political dynamics I've ever seen. We will, of course, talk about that as well. Like, you literally have dudes with Adolf Hitler avatars being like, my name is Adolf Hitler, I love Adolf Hitler, and also, I am supporting Israel unconditionally. Kill these Muslim Palestinian dogs. This is literally what I've seen time and time again on Indian Twitter. It's most, it's the most insane thing I have ever seen in my entire life, and for some reason... Like there was a right wing India account that basically said we should nuke Palestine, which, you know, is interesting because it's like, I don't know if you know this, but like if you nuked Palestine, Israel would also be nuked. There is no way to nuke Gaza without nuking Israel. Uh, so, you know, that's something that they need to understand. Of course, uh, the, the uh, Indian Israeli relationship is a one sided one. Uh, it is not a it is not a relationship that has uh, any kind of... <laughs> it's not a relationship that is reciprocated. So, American geography takes. Lol, are you new to politics? Yeah. So, that's uh, that's an interesting perspective to also uh, consider. So, yeah. My perspective on the matter before we get to the Yanis Varoufakis. And I I will... Uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blast off right now. I forgot to do that. Okay. Uh, I have so many opinions. It's hard. Okay. So, I... Uh, here, this is what I uh, this is what I said back uh, launching off of what Israeli journalist Gideon Levi said on the BBC. First, I will show you what he said. This is immediately after when when uh, the Israeli government tried to retaliate against uh, Gazans. Uh, here is what he said, and then I'll tell you what I what my perspective is again, so you understand. Gaza is a cage. Is the biggest prison in the world. Nobody spoke about lifting the siege. And, you know, people who live now 17 years in a cage want to resist. And if they have the possibility, they do it. 
And I'm surprised that they had the possibility because the barrier, I know the barrier around Gaza, billions of, of dollars were spent there to build this unbelievable barrier under the surface and above the surface with all kinds of electronic devices. And finally, you see that the spirit of resistance is many times stronger than anything else. And they broke it and penetrated into Israel, which is now shocked. Gaza. Yeah, this is not me saying it. It's an Israeli journalist in the BBC saying it in the immediate aftermath of a massive of a massive military operation inside of the borders of Israel that has never happened before with many civilians dying and a ton of hostages that they took to which I responded with and this was still my perspective there is no perfect retaliation to apartheid there are only victims everywhere one party holds all the power to end the violence however and it's certainly not the Palestinians living under a colonial apartheid regime that has chained them in an open air prison, it bombs routinely. And there are plenty of people, there are plenty of people who refuse to see that and say, well, uh, you know, they really blew it. I saw a lot of people saying they really blew it. The Palestinians really blew it. The backlash is going to be so bad. They're going to end up killing a bunch of Palestinians. To them, I say, do you think this calculation is not in the minds of Palestinians? You can push humans only so far until they realize that this is their only method. They will go out on their own terms in this regard. You want to stop the violence. You want to stop the bloodshed. You have to, you have to pull back on your end because this violence and this bloodshed is disproportional. The violence is asymmetrical. Okay. People say, people try to make this distinction between Hamas and Palestinians. You are completely oblivious to the reality. Hamas is a uh, is a Muslim Brotherhood fundamentalist cutout. It also happens to be the only popular form of governance amongst Palestinians. Do you want to know why that is the case? Do you want to examine the reason as to why Palestinians who are comprised of incredibly diverse backgrounds are now looking at a, a fundamentalist group of, of Islamists for the most part as their only savior? Do you think that it is important to analyze that situation? Or do you think it's easy to just say, let's separate Hamas from the Palestinian plight. Let's separate Hamas and their actions. They are different. This is, the reason why people do this is because they want to support Palestinian people, but they think the only support Palestinian people can get is if they are perfect victims. If they just sit back and die except the media rarely ever covers it when that happens for year after year after year, when they march peacefully to that same border wall so they can peacefully return, which is their right, and they get sniped in the thousands. When it's like little kids, 14-year-olds, nurses, they get sniped and they get fucking killed, and nobody ever makes a peep pregnant women dying because they peacefully marched. The greatest comparison is... The greatest comparison to the circumstances here is either to Algeria and its violent struggle against colonial uh, uh, French occupation or Nelson Mandela and the ANC fighting against apartheid. So today, I also want to cover the, the, the often forgotten, often whitewashed history of the struggle against South African apartheid because... The ANC, the African National Congress, originally was a peaceful movement. It was a peaceful movement, and they were peacefully resisting against this unjustifiable apartheid state. And yet, it got to a point where, you know, 69, uh, 69 black people were butchered, mercilessly slaughtered, where even Nelson Mandela realized that it is not necessarily just a struggle it, when all other opportunities are lost, when there is no other way to push back against a colonial state, an apartheid state that is unjustifiably treating you like a second-class citizen, then you must engage in violent struggle. Violence, as I've always said, is a constant in politics. It's a constant in politics. It's unchanging. Nelson Mandela was on the U.S. FBI terrorist watch list until 2008, long after he had won and had actually 
changed, or not changed rather, but moved to immediately facilitate peace in South Africa. 2008, he was democratically elected as a leader in 1994, and it, until 2008, he was still considered a terrorist. Nelson Mandela was offered freedom after being jailed, I believe, in 1967, after uh, he went to Algeria and Ethiopia and learned about the violent struggle against colonial occupation and came back and said, the people deserve, the people demand emancipation, and they are willing to take matters into their own hands, and there is no other way to do this, okay? We have debated for far too long. There's no more room for debate. There's no more room for civil disobedience. This does not work. And they jailed him. They jailed him while, while his supporters still continued their acts of violence. Now, let me tell you something. The world branded them terrorists. The world branded Nelson Mandela as a terrorist. He was on the terrorist watch list until 2008. Remember that, okay? In that entire process, there were moments where there was also a lot of, especially in the aftermath of the dissolution of the USSR, where people were realizing that there was no longer uh, the threat of communism. People wanted change in South Africa, and there was a robust boycott, divestment, and sanction move, a movement, a peaceful movement to boycott, divest, and sanction the state of South Africa as long as it continues its apartheid. This movement actually took hold, and it applied external pressure. Foreign capital chose to pull out of South Africa, so both of these factors, violence on the ground and external pressure, caused an ally, caused an ally of the United States, an ally of the West, uh, in a deeply anti-communist state that engaged in a, a, a never-ending, engaged in a never-ending continued violent military apparatus that forcibly oppressed black people, treated them as second-class citizens. It finally ended, but throughout that duration, Nelson Mandela was told on not one, but two different occasions, 10 years apart, if you condemn the violence, we will let you go free. The ANC at the time was still banned. The African National Congress, okay? The ANC at the time was banned. Nelson Mandela the first time said, how can you negotiate with me when I am still chained in prison? I will not concede. Once again, I believe in 1985, the last time they, they went to Nelson Mandela and said, we will free you if you denounce Marxism, if you denounce communism, and if you denounce the violence that your supporters are engaging in. And he said, through his daughter, no, I will not denounce Marxism, I will not denounce communism, and I will not denounce the violent actions that people are engaging in as long as the apartheid continues, as long as we are not able to participate in political action, I will, I will stay in prison. And they had to concede at the end. They had to release him from prison, and he became uh, the president. This is very important to understand because anti-colonial struggle is not pretty. Anti-colonial struggle is going to have a lot of unnecessary and, and horrifying acts of violence, okay? Mandela was not a tanky Lemefeao is something you can say now, just like Martin Luther King was a revisionist. Why can you say that? Because we have whitewashed his history. Nobody, most people do not know the history of Nelson Mandela because they only know Nelson Mandela as the guy who uh, went up and played nice with the same prosecutor who fucking threw him in jail and wanted to give him the death penalty. You know him as the leader of South Africa. You do not know him as the revolutionary figure of South Africa. That is by design. Because if you knew him as a revolutionary figure, by the way, I love being like, Nelson Mandela is not a tanky, because if you use the terminology tanky, then yes, Nelson Mandela would fit that. 100,000%, 100, 
just so you know. Okay. What do you mean he's not a tangy? He, 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 yeah. Hey, Algerian here. The National Liberation Front had to literally move away from the countryside and the mountains of northern Algeria to the cities. The movie Battle of Algiers showcases the brutal reality of decolonialization by taking the fight to the settlers themselves. It's an unfortunate reality, but that's how it's been historically speaking. Absolutely. We're going to get to all of it in a second.